Okay, colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, for those who have just come in, I'm Urban Student. I'm chair of the Worldwide Commission to Educate All Kids Post-Pandemic and uh, co-founder of, the, <laughs> co of the, uh, the Institute for 21st Century Questions, which is hosting this. The other co-founder is a great Canadian based in The Hague. He sends his regards. Again, we had a wonderful uh, morning, and I was just speaking with Canute and Kirby and, and colleagues about the, the documentary. When we uh, lead the documentary online, please, colleagues, I hope you will make it go viral. Nobody is making any money off of it. It is to change the understanding of the crisis, and it does this at an extremely granular level. And Canute was saying that, that it uh, brought back tears. I would cry when we had our commission calls behind the scenes or afterwards took a long time to recover because uh, what we were hearing from all these countries was very foreign to the Canadian experience. And yet, the catastrophe starts at our feet in Canada in March of 2020 in the schools and vis-a-vis -vis the, the young people, the children, except, as I was expressing to Canute, it took us, and me in particular, a long time to accept what we were seeing. A long time between Confirmation of what I was seeing and acceptance, it was probably about three months. I was kept saying to colleagues, is this really happening? Can it be? Sometimes I'm still in disbelief. And when I would go to colleagues who lived more at the coal face of life and death and with greater familiarity of disaster in Argentina, in the Middle East, in South Asia, in parts of Europe, in the Caribbean, they would say, yeah, we got it right away. There was disintegration of the system as soon as you close the system, thermodynamics, as I mentioned. Now, the idea of the commission was that it, if it took us a while to accept, it took us just as long, if not longer, to communicate the problem, to express it in terms that were sufficiently compelling to uh, compel action. And that's our work. We're very practical. We're not just intellectual and policy-oriented. We're really on the ground. And here are three people who are, have been at the coalface from the start. And uh, before I introduce them, I want to say that uh, the migration psychologically that is still required of us in Canada to accept what's happened with the third bucket catastrophe and the general education system in terms of undereducation, under socialization, they made this a while ago. That's why it's so important to hear from them. We have uh, two people, unfortunately, who were not able to make the flight. If we were able to get Uganda and Jamaica, I was on the phone with the Jamaican ambassador as late as last week to make sure the Canute was here. I said, make sure Canute was here. But we couldn't get Montreal here in time. <laughs> uh, and uh, Quadro Karamantang, who's a great colleague from Ottawa, uh, is not able to come for, uh, for scheduling reasons, but he sends his regards, including online. I'm going to start with Martha Fulford, just a quick introduction. Uh, Martha was originally a colleague, a uh, combatant in arms, as it were, and now I would consider a friend. When I was intervening in the papers, uh, in, in, in interventions in the media, on the question of school closures, well before we understood Third Bucket Kids, I said, is there anyone else doing this? And they said, Martha is. So when I called Martha, the connection was clear, and we've been at it uh, since collaborating. She's, she's wonderful and, and is extremely uh, human. She is an uh, outgoing uh, professor of the Faculty of Medicine, a pediatric specialist at McMaster University, and I should say a former uh, high school teacher, so she, she gets it cold. Steve Axworthy uh, is a physical education teacher at Chankaga, Otina, Dakota, Waiyawa, Tipi School, Birdtail, Sioux, Sioux uh, Dakota Nation, Manitoba. So he'll tell you about the reality at the coalface in the indigenous communities, where, dare I say, the third bucket rate was well north of 50%, as we began to understand quickly on the, in our commission work. And we're delighted to have Grant Frost, who's a classroom teacher from Halifax of more than 30 years, an educational commentator and writer, and a part-time faculty member at Mount St. Vincent. So we're going to talk about the Canadian context, what happened, where we are, and what's to be done. So thanks. A big round of applause to our Canadian panelists. <laughs> Let me start with Martha, and as we did, we structured it um, 
the last panels, let's go back to March of 2020 and a few months out. What happened on the ground as you saw it, and what's our understanding now? So just a little bit of background so, so that you have a bit more context of what Irvin um, just gave you. I'm actually an infectious disease specialist by training. Um, I got very interested in health when I was teaching, and, and I am a secondary, or I was a secondary school teacher, but I was actually teaching overseas. I worked in Lesotho in Southern Africa for two years, and I was in Zimbabwe for three and a half years. And during that period of time, I got very interested in the link between education and health. While I was working in Southern Africa, it's when the HIV uh, pandemic was at its worst, and, and the impact on, uh, on, the, on the whole population was, was devastating. And it was in that context, I actually applied to medical school, got accepted, a bit to my surprise, and here I am. And then I, I came, I became an infectious disease specialist. I, I loved my work. I was a clinician. I, I'm not a fancy researcher. I'm not like a mega academic. I was a hospital-based physician. But in infectious diseases, we work with infections, obviously. I worked through the first SARS um, outbreak here. I, I was uh, very aware of what happened with Walkerton in Ontario. Uh, for those of you familiar with, with it was a waterborne um, outbreak. I was heavily involved with planning for the H1N1 pandemic. And, and in that, I meant at the hospital base for pandemic plans at the institutional level, but also at the municipal and provincial level. I was very involved with infection prevention and control um, with the province, doing consulting work, doing work in this area. And so I came, when, when, when COVID hit, this was the background I came from. So I'm working at McMaster Children's Hospital, I'm a pediatric, um, and well, I cross covered, I do both pediatric and adult infectious diseases. But I'm essentially based at a pediatric hospital. And I'm on the ground, I'm in a hospital. And what I can tell you is we did not have children admitted with COVID. Some of them, sure would test positive, but they were not being admitted because they were sick with COVID. But we were, were seeing was a, a, a marked increase in eating disorders, in depression, in overdoses, in suicidality. And we were also seeing very delayed diagnoses. And so things that we would have caught early were being seen very late because we had shut down all, so, clinics, we had shut down, you know, we diverted all of the resources into, into just COVID. And the net result was very delayed diagnoses. And, and, you know, just one example, as an eight-month-old baby, I was asked to see who had had a fever for almost 10 days. Now, pre-COVID, any infant with a fever is instantly worked up. But because everybody was so scared of COVID, this child, it was 10 days before she appeared in hospital, she had a very significant bacterial infection that was in her hip, and she actually had a destruction of the bone. That's a lifelong problem for that child, and that's something that should never have happened. The other type of thing we were seeing was it was uh, one of the, the things that really sort of woke, woke me up, if that's the term we want, was a, an 11-year-old who was admitted, again, for a very pure medical reason. But she was very withdrawn, very apathetic, really didn't talk. And I asked the mom, is she OK? Is there something else going on? And the mother says to me, oh, she's just a pandemic kid. We have this utterly withdrawn child who's just now a pandemic kid. And that was the collateral damage I was seeing. And that's why I started to speak out, because nothing that we were doing fit with anything I'd previously been taught about pandemic management. I was part of pandemic management plan creation. And what was, I was seeing on the ground had nothing to do with what we'd done with pandemic management. I could read the data. I could see that what we were doing was different than, say, Sweden, other European countries. Um, I could read the impact of this virus by age group. It was very clear by May, by, actually by April, probably of 2020, but certainly by May, that this was a virus that is very se potentially severe for the elderly, people with other severe medical conditions, but that essentially spared young people. And so it made no sense to me what we were doing. And I did start to speak out. The first time I spoke out was probably May of 2020. And I kept trying. Um, I wrote op-eds, I wrote letters, I advocated. Uh, anybody who you know, tried to ask me to speak, I would speak out. It was the first time in my entire life I'd actually gone public with any opinion. 
but somebody had to advocate for our children because all I could see around me was the collateral damage. Uh, and and that's sort of how I, I came to this. I, I find myself a little bit of a, you know, an odd position because I'm a physician and I was just a hospital-based physician and, and uh, I couldn't understand why nobody else was speaking out. And I think there are a lot of questions to be asked about that. I think, you know, where we are now, I, I, I guess if I was going to have my wish list, uh, there are two paths I think we need to take. One, I do think it's important to ask what happened in, in the fullness of time. I, I think we need to look at Sweden, which never locked down, which did in fact follow its previous existing pandemic management plan. It's not that they ignored COVID. COVID was very real. It's just that they handled it in the way we were supposed to. And if you look at their outcomes in the, after a few years, they have some of the lowest excess mortality of any country in Europe. Because of course, how we come out of something like a pandemic is not just deaths from the virus, but it's all the deaths. It's all the harm, and the job of government and public health is to minimize damage across every sector, and not just the tunnel vision on the virus. And Sweden's done very well. So we should look at them and ask, how did they manage to stay open? What did they do right? And maybe what did they not do so right? What did we do that was maybe good and not so good? So that's kind of the retrospective that would be nice for lessons learned. That's one thing that can be done. More important and more compelling, regardless of your position or our position on school closures, whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do, they happened. Now we're in a position in 2023 where, where we're dealing with the effect of the school closures, and that's where this is so important and I think critical, is how do we then recover from that? Because yes, it's easy to want to forget. It was a very traumatizing time. I think a lot of people would just like to move on. But we have a whole cohort, a whole generation of children that aren't going to be able to move on unless we help. And the analogy of how do you eat an elephant is perfect, one bite at a time. It is overwhelming, but we have to start. And something like this project is one start. Is how do we get kids involved back into education? Maybe formal education is the right route for them anymore. Maybe it is reinventing apprenticeship programs. Uh, somebody mentioned vocations. I mean, these are highly valuable training programs which lead to very good job security. Um, we can look at vocational programs. There's got to be flexibility and imagination and how we reinvent education and how we look at reintegrating um, children and youth because that is a future. Uh, it's, it's, we don't do that. This is a generation where we are going to have impact on their health. If you are educated, you're unlikely to get a job. If you're unlikely to get a job, you're going to have financial security. If you have financial security, you're going to have housing insecurity. You're going to have addiction problems. You're going to have homeless problems. You're going to have violence and behavior problems. And so the, the, while my advocacy and my passion is for helping the youth, if we don't do this, all of society, we're going to have this impact for at least another generation. And so that's why, that's why I'm really hoping that something like this project is the first step of reintegrating our kids. Thank you, Martha. And uh, just if we could ask the sound person to make sure that the sound is working well on all sides. Olivier, and then we'll move over to Steve. Thank you, Martha. Terrific start. We'll go to Steve and uh, delighted that you're here uh, and tell us about the reality on the both in Manitoba and particularly on the reserve schools in Manitoba? When it comes to Manitoba as a whole, but I think this is endemic of the education system that we find ourselves in Canada, it is deeply flawed. Um, what I see in general as an educator is generations of students who have, and I hate this word more than anything, but very little to no grit whatsoever. And that ultimately, I believe, comes from the origin of education, which is that the whole reason that we're able to be in this room right now is because our, our kids, our students, is what I always refer to them as, um, are typically supposed to be at home farming right now. Ultimately, that is where we originated, but that is no longer the case. Now they're on their iPads and their phones. But what we have in our 
education system across this country, regardless of which province it is, is the students come home to their parents. Their parents basically assume that the teacher is now the parent and I'm gonna give my student a iPad or a phone and they can go off and do whatever they want and they'll go off to school tomorrow. And something is seriously wrong with this system because we have adopted, as one of the other presenters um, from India had mentioned, um, the digitization of essentially our lives and the damage it's doing to our students is on the verge of being irreparable because we're no longer training them how to have deliberate practice in their life. And deliberate practice is a fundamental tenant of being able to learn how to persevere and push through um, something that, uh, some sort of challenge. And so without that skill and without that ability, you have students who expect the answer when they walk into school. You have students who um, expect the teacher to bend and yield to th themselves. That, I mean, Honestly, can anybody in this room actually imagine going up to maybe some of the, maybe some of the younger uh, people here, but actually going up to your teacher when you were a child and saying, um, can I please have a B or an A because I swear I really super tried on this. And meanwhile, it has tons of spelling errors, has tons of grammatical errors, and it's half done. But then actually being rewarded with an A plus because my mommy called. There's nobody in this room that can, can imagine that uh, um, if you're in school over 20 years ago. So then we fast forward over to the pandemic. And I think that I was in a really unique situation because my background, uh, even though I, I have a personal training certificate, um, that's on top of me graduating from uh, the arts. And so I knew how to operate digital equipment. So I actually never lost a beat for me personally. But what I witnessed was an entire uh, group of adults who didn't understand how to use technology, uh, who didn't understand how to use uh, video conferencing, and who didn't have the basic um, uh, tools at their disposal to be able to uh, excel in, in, their, in their jobs. And just overnight, we had spoken about this last night, um, it was as though somebody had uh, you know, sent out a tweet as, as, we, as we discussed, and suddenly the whole, the whole thing changed. And everybody was expected to change on a dime. And teachers were left in the middle of nowhere, which meant the kids were left in the middle of nowhere because the kids didn't know what to do. And so to your point, the municipalities didn't step up, the provinces didn't step up, the governments didn't step up, they put the money forward, but the planning was not there. And teachers can adapt because that's our job. And we, te and we teach adaptation. But from that, we didn't know where to go because all we had suddenly was uh, uh, Google, um, there's, there's Teams and, and, and Google Teams or whatever it's called, um, thank you. <laughs> and about three or four different programs, but they all, we all had to figure out how to use this. And in 24 hours, we went from, from in-person to, to online. And that was, a, that was a case for disaster. In terms of what we see in indigenous communities, uh, this is, and it's not an exaggeration, this is how my high school grading went. 0, 0, 0, 100 percent, 0, 0, 0, 80, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 86 percent, 0, 0, 0, 0, 96. I was lucky if I had six students in my classroom out of 60. Um, in terms of my grade three classroom, it, it was a phenomenal day when I got 10, and they were fantastic kids, but there were 35 in that student, or in, the, in that classroom. Typically, I'd have about um, anywhere between two to maybe eight. And that is throughout the entire school. So, on indigenous uh, communities, and obviously I'm not indigenous, and I'm not trying to speak for the indigenous community at all, um, it's just my experience is that pre-pandemic, um, 
depending on the reserve you were in, uh, retention was a really difficult thing. And after uh, the pandemic, especially without that cultural component to education, which we keep missing with Indigenous students, there was no ties to anything, and they all went to their phones, and they all went to their computers, and that was it, and we lost them. So we went from an already horrible scenario, or situation rather, to an absolute abysmal situation. With that said, we were able to get some back, and the students that we had were phenomenal. Um, I believe that the way that we need to move forward in education is to realize that we're failing our students, but also that our parents don't know how to be teachers, because the parents are teachers. We're all teachers. And so if we take that under consideration and we realize that society as a whole is actively teaching our students that we need to come together and start pushing our students for excellence, then we can actually have a future where we have a strong economy and one where we have a strong democracy. But until we start realizing that this, um, uh, what's, uh, what's the term? Um, no child left behind. And I know there's a whole bunch of people in here that's about to, scrim to jump up and say that Canada does not have no child left behind. We have no child left behind. Because if I'm in grade three and I don't do anything the whole year, I get passed. If I'm in grade four and I don't do anything, I get passed. If I'm in grade five, all the way up till grade nine, and then on grade nine we say, no, you fail. Where's the resilience? How do you go from that into a lockdown where you're not allowed to leave your home and now I'm supposed to start learning? It's just, it's, there's nothing there. There's no logic to it. So we need to start thinking about education from the ground up and from the point of view that we are trying to raise successful people. And absolutely, we need to think about new ways um, like, the, uh, like vocational training. But we need to monetize our students' dreams for them. Because when we monetize a student's dreams, they see the potential that they have in front of them and they start creating their own goals and they look at education as, that's why math is important. That's why English is important. That's why social studies is important. Oh my God, this is why I actually need to pay attention to the war in Ukraine. This is why I need to understand what's happening um, in Sudan. This is the reason why I need to understand the basic economics of Japan and how it relates to Canada then things start to make sense. And when you make things make sense to a child, they'll excel and they will work for you. And that's what we really need to be focusing on with education. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Grant is from, uh, for those of you outside of Canada um, or who've not yet been there, is from, from one of the most beautiful parts of the country. And Nova Scotia in the house. Tell us how it was uh, from March 2020 in Atlantic Canada. Well, this makes it hard to clap, so. I'll use my teacher notes. Okay, so you can clap. Awesome. Now, I wonder if from this table down to you can clap uh, three times, please. Awesome, thank you. The rest of you, can I get you to clap four times? Thank you. So when I point to you, would you please give me your clap? So let's try this middle group. Oh, really? Seriously? Three times. I want, I want to ask. Can I get my four group, please? Awesome. Can I get my twos? Awesome. Can I get my twos? Threes. Four. Twos. We just had lunch. <laughs> so um, that's how they do it in Nova Scotia. That's how we do it in Nova Scotia. <laughs> so I'll give you a little bit of context about where I'm from. Uh, my specialty is talking about teachers and talking about the impact of educational change and uh, educational policy on the people who teach your kids. So in 2016, 
I got elected as a local union president. And at the same time, we had a new government take power. And that new government came in and said, our schools are failing. That was the mantra that they started with. Our schools are failing, so we're going to fix schools. Now, when people do that, I think what they neglect is the impact that has on the people working within the system. Because governments build those systems. They develop the, the plants, the schools, they decide who works in them, they decide how they run, they control everything about that system. And then for a government to come around and say, our schools are failing. Well, the people who are looking after your kids hear that. They hear it on the radio, they read it in the papers. Pretty hard to feel good about yourself as an employee if that's how your employer is looking at you. By about 2018, we were in our first legal strike. We had never gone on strike in Nova Scotia. In, in 100 years of education, it was our first strike. We were legislated back. Um, then along, uh, they hired a consultant from outside, uh, Dr. Avis Glaze, who came in, uh, got rid of school boards. I had an opportunity afterwards to talk to Diane Ravitch, who some of you may know from the United States, and uh, I explained to her that our school boards had been taken away from us. And she looked at me and said, oh, so I guess the public no longer controls public education in Nova Scotia. And then 2020 came. And in 2020, of course, in March of 2020, school shut down now. I was in a very different position for most of you because I was the guy who the teachers were calling, not the parents, not the kids, but the teachers. And I couldn't hang up my phone before it would ring again, with teachers petrified about going back into schools. So schools shut down, back and forth. And we went through the pandemic. At the end of the pandemic, we had a horrific incident in Nova Scotia, which was the largest mass shooting in our country's history, where a gentleman got into a, a mock police car, dressed up as an RCMP officer, which is our national police force, and drove across our province, sh killing innocent people. After that, we had get hit with Hurricane Fiona, which devastated a lot of homes, tremendous flooding, people lost livelihoods. Just recently on in June of this year, we had uh, forest fires ravage our province. We lost something like 250 homes. Um, in a very short period of time, a lot of those people were teachers, families, uh, schools were, were closed for safety reasons because there were fires. And uh, some of the schools remained open even though they were in evacuation zones where we were told you have to get out of this area within 30 minutes. You have to be able to leave this area within 30 minutes. And some of our children were in schools. So the question becomes, well, how do I possibly evacuate a school in 30 minutes? And then just two weeks ago, or no, I'm sorry, God, it was a week ago, I apologize. Um, we received 10 inches of rain in about six hours. Torrential flooding, more homes lost. I, I tell you that because um, <laughs> we're a little raw, if you can imagine, out on the East Coast. Um, it's been body blow after body blow after body blow for the people who are looking after your kids. Now, when the kids did come back to schools, they came in with masks on, and we, we worked hard to make those connections with kids. We did everything within our power, and, and you have not, you have not existed as a school teacher until you spent a year and a half telling kids, put your mask up. Okay, that was, that was my exit, put your mask up, put your mask up. And during COVID we tried. We tried to reach those kids, we tried to connect. And then we were told to pivot during COVID. Well, we're going back to school. Oh, no, we're coming out of school. No, we're going to online, we're coming offline. And then we came back after COVID and immediately came the mantra, well, let's get back to work. Let's get back to doing the same things that we've always done in the way that we've always done them. So when I think about the Nova Scotia context and I think about this, and a lot has been said, so I'm not gonna repeat sort of the, the, the stuff that's gone on. But I think the one thing that I would ask everybody in this room to focus on as we move forward, because we have to move forward. I, I mean, it, it was there, it happened, done now, hopefully we've learned a lot of lessons. But I want you just for a minute, and I like this analogy, I want you for a minute to take in your head to picture a child you love. It doesn't have to be your own kid. <laughs> it could be somebody else's. But I want you to picture a child you love. 
That child walks up to a classroom door and does this. Hey, teacher, you got a second? Now, who do you want sitting in that chair? How rested do you want that individual? How ready to respond to that child? Yeah, you know what? Come on in. I do got a second. What's up? So as we move forward from the pandemic, I think, yes, we, we need to focus on the children, absolutely. But the best way to focus on those kids is to think about those caregivers and how can we best arm them and support them in the coming years to deal with this because we're dealing with it on a daily basis. These kids come to our class every day, two and three years behind, and we're dealing with it. But man, we could use some help. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Martha, let's go to you and um, we'll go to the practical now, building on what Grant said about the what's to be done. First of all, for the kids who left the system, the third bucket, and secondly, how to maximize energy coming back into the fall for everyone who's remaining in the system. For the third bucket, I mean, this is where I think it does require a lot of imagination, and I think it is, as we we're alluding to, rethinking what the education system involves. I mean, several of us have said this already, uh, is um, if we're going to try to attract or, or get these youth back into a system, it can be traditional school, but I think we have to be very open that there are non-traditional ways to educate people as well. This is where the vocational, where work experience maybe, where apprenticeships, where we need to get a lot of buy-in, quite frankly, from the society, and so, and, and on the ground stuff. I mean, there's no other way to, to, I think, bring a child in than to go to that child or that that youth and say and show them that you care that you're trying to bring them in because I think it's up to the adults to go to the youth and, and try to encourage them in it's hard I, it's just I'm, I'm certainly no expert in this I'm a, I'm a physician I, I mean it's been a long time since I was in a classroom um sorry what was part two there the energy part. oh the energy well I mean that's an interesting question because supporting the teachers is absolutely critical I mean it's it's, it's supporting a system and it's, it is, in fact, I think, it's not just money. Uh, money is sort of, you can't throw money at a problem without a plan on how you're going to spend it, how you're going to focus it, how you're going to try to get this in. We have shortages across the board, and somebody talked about getting teachers involved, getting grandparents or um, parents involved, grandparents, other types of things, whether it be youth groups in the community, whether it be sports groups, but we have to try to, 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 I guess, get us working together. And the energy is a hard one because people are tired. And, and what worries me is I see a lot of people wanting to pretend it didn't happen, just, just wanting to move on and pretend that none of this ever happened. And, and so I don't think I have a solution other than I think it's important that we, that we recognize this is a, a, a society-wide issue. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure I have every answer, but certainly, and you know, people can identify troubled youth and try to get them in. I mean, I do that all the time, even now. Um, if I if I see something, I actually point them to resources. I, I bring them to the schools. I have actually mentioned um, the Project Youth Energy to a few a few of the disengaged children. So I mean, I think all of us have a role to play. But I guess probably the the on the ground teachers may have a better idea of of how to sort of, you know, get that energy and get get our children back involved. It would be nice for government to at least. I mean, we can't depend on government for everything, but to at least participate in acknowledging that this is an issue and and in supporting endeavors, uh, and and. I guess being open to them, because it's not just dumping on people, but it's supporting them. So I do appreciate that, that that's really important. Maybe just to encourage the pivot in, in the conversation, then we'll open up to, to Canadian colleagues and international colleagues alike. I, I was struck by our conversation at lunchtime with, with uh, Canute and also Kirby. Canute says, building on his comments, that in Jamaica, they went yard by yard. And in Arkansas, they went door to door. And in Argentina, they went door to door. And in Sri Lanka, they went community to community with food. Food is a hook for the young person who needs food and sometimes gets the food from school. By the way, Judith Berry, co-founder of uh, K-12 
kids breakfast clubs across Canada was, was going to speak to that part. But in Canada, we're several layers removed from yard to yard. We're email to email. We're phone call to phone call, text to text. Now, in my time in school, is much more granular. And before that generation, it was even gr more granular still, more Jamaica-like. But this is a very human problem. And the energy can't be generated by more emails or more texts or more Facebook posts. It's only on the granular level. So this is a good pivot to Steve because a lot of your work is at the granular level, at the human level, far more so than the rest of the country. So tell us how we can do this and scale this up across the country because I can't see it being done certainly by speeches or, or texts or, or better emails. Uh, I'll give you two words. It is food and gym. And I'm not, sa I'm not saying that to get a laugh. I'm saying that legitimately. No, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, the nutrition of our students is abhorrent. Um, the uh, fast food industry and the uh, sugar industry have been able to run rampant, and it is destroying the mental health of our children. Um, this would be a typical day in um, pretty much a, any student in this country, but definitely um, in the community of which I come from. Uh, I come to school, I haven't had any food, so I go up to my teacher, and my teacher says, okay, I'm going to give you a granola bar, because I think granola bars are healthy. If you've ever taken a look at a granola bar, not so much. The granola is healthy. The stuff that you actually make into the bar is not. Okay, so that ties me over for about 20 minutes, and I then start to have a sugar crash. So now I'm starting to act out. So the teacher tells me to uh, go over and see Miss, in my case, Miss M, who's a fantastic teacher. Um, and so the child goes over, sorry, the student goes over and sees the uh, school counselor. So the school counselor sits down with uh, the student for a little while, gets the student back under control, and probably gets as much as, much as she's awesome, probably a lollipop for, uh, for uh, the trouble. So then the student goes back, is on a sugar high, back to the class, has a sugar crash, another 20 minutes later, and now has my juice, juice box from my, uh, from my, bo uh, sorry, from, from my lunch box. Then I have my sugar high, now it's lunch. And so I take out my lunch, uh, my lunch bag, and what's in it? It's gonna be a fruit roll up, possibly a sandwich which I'm gonna throw out, or possibly trade over for another, uh, for another can of Coke, or probably at this point I think it's Monster, uh, which is what all the kids are uh, eating. Then I have another major crash, the resource teacher's called in. The resource teacher, for my troubles, give, gives me an apple, thank God. And then I go home, and my parents, because they don't have that much money more because of income inequality are giving me a whole bunch of sugary things and then I go to sleep because I haven't studied and I'm too tired to study and then I start the whole process over again. Our kids are living on sugar highs and sugar crashes and the teachers are the ones who are picking up the pieces and the kids are the ones who are suffering. So that's the first thing. What we need is to fix taxation. I know that that's larger than the scope of this, of this project, but we need to get money back into the schools specifically for food. Technology, leave it alone. Get it into the food, into quality food, and you will fix the kids. Second part of it, 15 minutes of running. 15 minutes of running, and you change a student's mood for the rest of the day. 15 minutes, that's nothing. If we started to do those two things, we could start to change the mental health of our kids. When the kids come to school and they're full, and they come to school and they feel good about being at school because we got them to run for 15 minutes, they start to associate school with feeling good. So that's, that's the first thing that we can do. The second thing is that uh, we need, or the first two things we can do. Uh, the second thing is that um, we need to really get, uh, get, get at the parents. And we need to start showing the parents how to be teachers and have them realize that they are educators too. So just to uh, read this real quick, as a psychologist, uh, Lauren Steinberg in 2001, uh, who gave a presidential address to the Society uh, for the Research of Adolescents, uh, who suggested a moratorium on further research on parenting styles because there was overwhelming evidence for the benefits of supportive, key supportive, and demanding parents that focuses, uh, that fo so the, what he's suggesting is that now the focus should be uh, preceded, um, or sorry, uh, placed on uh, less definitive issues. 
So again, going back to this idea of supporting the student at all costs, showing them that we care about them, also coming from the parent, but having those high, um, high um, metrics and, those, and trying to get them to have that idea of high achievement in their head. The next thing, and I apologize, I just made notes ahead of time. Um, the next thing is to understand what pressure is. And once you understand what pressure is, now you can actually get into the nitty gritty of helping the students. So it comes down to three things. This is from um, Dane Jensen, who has a fantastic uh, book called um, uh, essentially On Pressure. It's importance, uncertainty, and volume. And when you, when you identify what the importance of a subject is, because a student has a, f a proper life goal, again, then they can come back and they understand why they're learning what they're learning in education. To allow a student to understand why they're in school in the first place gets them back into school, especially the ones who have dropped out. So our vocational students, if they understand why they're learning math and they understand that, oh, geometry is actually really helpful for, uh, for my vocational work, you'll get them back into the classroom. I can't promise that, but it's going to help. Um, the other thing we need to do is that we actually need to teach students how to learn. We don't do that anymore. Our first week or two weeks should be taken up with teaching students proper techniques and how to learn. When a child falls down, because they're going to fall down, we then take that opportunity to have them reflect on what happened and have them understand what they can do better. And then we give them a couple of extra strategies and tools in their toolbox. And that helps them understand how to better themselves in the future. And the very last thing, and that's where I circled this uh, right when... Um, right when we were going over everything, was... Nope, oh, I'm done. That was it. Thank you, Steve. The, before we go to Grant, it just, uh, it's opposite that on the commission, the Sri Lankans, the Argentinians, and the Costa Ricans said, we do food runs, we do food festivals, the kids will come out. We feed them at the same time, they depend on that food, but we'll find out who is who. It's a granular activity that we could do across Canada, even to the summer uh, and the early fall, to find out who's who uh, amongst the third bucket kids. On, on the energy front, here the Americans come. They said sport, football. The Jamaicans talked about track. You get the kids out, you get them energized, but you find out who's behind. These are also things that we could do. So the summer is not wasted time, and the, and the fall, although at a very late stage, is an opportunity for ambition and energy. And uh, Martha wants to intervene before Grant. Just, I can't emphasize enough that I, I'm, as a physician, that physical activity and, and the sport, and it doesn't have to be a formal team sport with lots of equipment and lots of driving, but physical activity will set up a, a, a child or an adolescent for a much healthier and longer life. Many of the chronic diseases we see are diseases of lifestyle, and by that I mean a poor lifestyle. So being physically fit not just might contribute to energy, but it's going to contribute to a healthier and a longer life. So I can't endorse that strongly enough. Um, so I'm going to brag a little bit about the Nova Scotia system. And I understand that if you're coming from an international context, you know, you, you might be sort of blown away by what I'm about to say. Um, but we do have a very robust uh, breakfast program in Nova Scotia for students. Um, we also, a few years ago, um, passed some uh, policies around what could be served at the cafeteria. Um, so uh, we've uh, dictated that they have to be the people who get paid to do the cafeteria because we farm that out to some P3 organization. Um, they have to have a, um, a certain meet a certain criteria uh, of nutrition for the kids, so that the kids aren't just always buying sort of greasy things. Um, so that gets to the, to the first point. Um, something else we've done in Nova Scotia that again requires some money. Unfortunately, most things do. Um, in the Halifax region, there's, uh, which is our central city, like it's our largest city, Halifax, Nova Scotia, by the way, has about a million people. Uh, up until COVID, there was you know, 750,000, and during COVID, 200, you know, a quarter of a million people from Ontario moved to Nova Scotia because the real estate was cheap. Um, but what we've done is we've set up this Halifax Regional Arts Group, um, and what they are is uh, it's an opportunity for students to get school credits that are taught by teachers in the arts uh, both after school and during school. Um, so we have a group of um, fine arts specialists. We don't just hire anybody. We fire, hire visual artists, uh, drama teachers, music teachers, 
to go out into the schools and augment whatever program's going on. Um, so you'd have a visual arts specialist go into a social studies room and help that. You'd have a drama specialist go into a room and, and work with a math teacher. Um, and these specialists are paid for through a little bit of a, an extra tax that happens. Everybody hates that word. A um, little bit of an extra. So it's funded through the, the municipality, not through the province. So the municipality collects a little bit extra on property taxes and funnels that into the fine arts in Nova Scotia. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen such a tremendous... Um, Hearing all the stories uh, and having done some research uh, since being invited to the conference, and thank you again for this. Um, we, Nova Scotia did a really good job. Atlantic Canada seems to have done a really good job of maintaining students. Um, when we look at our dropout rates, uh, our enrollment rates, they've been pretty consistent even post-COVID. Difficult to pull out how many students we lost with the third bucket issue um, because we had such an influx of people moving into our province, so the numbers were changing. But I think that had a lot to do with the fact that we were focusing in on the arts and on these, on these special projects. The other thing, though, and this is a bit of a soapbox moment for me, is I think that uh, in, in all our countries, I think we have to stop. I think education is tremendously important, but I think we have to stop looking at it as the, the, the be-all and end-all to fix all of society's woes. Um, what, why aren't the kids getting their breakfast in the morning? Right? What, why are they not eating? What is it that's causing those parents to have to work two and three and four jobs? And I think particularly here in Canada, where we are such a wealthy nation, um, we could look at taking some of that pressure off the schools. But what we tend to do is look to the schools. Schools, how are you going to fix that the kids don't get breakfast? Schools, how are you going to look to exercise your students? Schools, how are you going to look to fix these issues? Um, it's a very easy uh, statement for the government to make to say that we're going to pour more money into schools so we can, you know, schools can fix this for us. And ultimately, when they say schools can fix this for us, they're ultimately turning to uh, educators, EPAs, principals, vice principals, the people in the classroom and saying, here, now you're running the breakfast program. The government can say, we're good and, and move on from there. So I think that would be the three things. Uh, increase the arts, the outreach into the communities, um, you know, and, and look to, to try to change that narrative that schools can fix all society's woes and they're the best way to, you know, wraparound systems are great, but they shouldn't be the only way the government gets out of trouble. Uh, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions from the floor. Faraz has uh, a mic. Hi, thank you. Uh, it, it's great to listen to all the, all the different views, and actually, Grant, I think you opened and refreshed my memory uh, about one of the important things uh, in remembering the, the effect on the teachers of this. I, I actually come from my, uh, my wife's family, has a lot of educators and I have a lot of friends. And I, you know, I just spent uh, some time last week on vacation with uh, some educators and they're trying to leave the system here in Ontario in particular. Um, in June 2020, I, I was speaking to my wife after, I think I met Irvin right around that time frame, you know, uh, protesting outside Queen's Park to get the schools opened. And I, I turned to my wife and I said, Ontario school system's gonna be a dumpster fire for the next three years. We have to get our kid out of province. So we sent one of our, my daughters away uh, to boarding school. Um, but what is clear to me is that there's a lot of feeling of bad faith among the parties. What was clear to me back then uh, in June 2020 already, we had the government uh, at the table um, we had the teachers unions at the table and we had the school boards at the table. And it was clear to me that none of them were on the same page on, uh, on anything to do with education here in Ontario. And I'm speaking for Ontario at least. And the teachers, or and the parents weren't even at the table, which was the kind of the abhorrent part of the whole thing. If I look back on that feeling of bad faith among all the parties, I don't think that's disappeared today, and I think your reminder is very clear about that. Um, for a system to function where all the stakeholders are disenfranchised from each other, that system is not going to work. Um, I think the question now in my mind became, and you know, I, I'm angry about X, Y, and Z with all the parties. I mean, that's something I have to kind of suppress all the time. We have to get to a place where we're not angry. The four parties aren't angry at each other. And um, I'm not sure how that can happen because right now it seems that they're so far apart. 
but that really, I don't, I don't know what the suggestions are, but that has to get looked at because otherwise the system itself isn't going to fix it. Maybe these outside measures will help some things, but the system itself has this big problem of disenfranchisement. Mark Grant? If, if I may? Yeah. Uh, so do I have a magic wand in this scenario? Like, can I just, can I fix everything? One of the most interesting, um, there's a couple of things. There's a great book by Daniel Pink uh, called Drive. And if you've got 15 minutes tonight in your hotel room, you can look it up online. And he does this great little cartoon character where he summarizes his book. And basically what he talks about uh, is that to be really, really good at anything, to, to really tap into that creativity side, that magic that people can, can tap into sometimes, you have to have three things. You have to have autonomy, you have to have mastery, and you have to have purpose. So he talks about learning an instrument. Some people will learn to play an instrument, never make a dime at it, but get really good at it. Well, why? Well, because they get to learn on their own. They have a sense that they're gonna get better, and they have a purpose. They understand what their goal is. Uh, I think that, um, and I'm not gonna go too far into the political side of things, but I think over the last, since the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, those things have been eroded from the public education system. Um, the teachers no longer have autonomy to make a lot of decisions. Um, they're told consistently that they're not good enough and they're never gonna be good enough. And they often don't understand the purpose of new directives that come down the pipeline. Um, so I think, that, I think that having the government take a little step back from looking to be so controlling and so political about public education would be, would be ideal. There's another book called Flipping the System. Um, I can never pronounce these gentlemen's names, so I'm not even gonna try. You can, you can Google it and you can, maybe you'll understand why. Essentially what they argue is if you picture a, a pyramid of sort of you know, a hierarchy of things, you have you know, the Ministry of Education at the top and you have, um, you know, you have the, the, the various sundry people, the principals, the, the, the teachers and then the students. And what often happens with influxes of money or influxes of policy is the person at the top says to the person below, okay, here's what I need you to do. And then this person says to the next person, here's what I need you to do, here's what I need, we're gonna change everything, we're gonna fix everything. And then finally it gets down to the teacher in the classroom, somebody's telling him, here's what I need you to have the kids do. What they suggest in that is you flip the pyramid completely so that the point of the pyramid is on the ground and that's where the, that's where the controlling body is. And the kids are at the top, at the top of this really, you know, on, on balance pyramid. And the kid goes to the teacher and, say, and, and the teacher says, here's what, the kid says to the teacher, here's what I need as opposed to, and then the teacher turns to the principal and says, here's what I need for this kid. And then the principal turns to the superintendent and says, here's what I need for my teacher for these kids. And they all turn to the government and say, here's what our schools need for our principals, for our teachers, for our kids. So if I had a magic wand, I would flip the entire system to follow that, as opposed to politicians coming in and saying, the last government screwed it up, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna change everything. Whenever they say the word, we're going to change stuff, they mean teachers are gonna do something different, teachers are gonna to have to learn a new system, uh, EPAs, principals are gonna to have to try something, they're gonna to have to learn a whole new set of parameters and still try to teach that kid that goes, hey teacher, you got a second. So that's what I'd do. Fred. Uh, in, here in Canada, uh, in the US, and obviously it appears in India and I suspect in many other countries, we have multiple levels of government involved in education. So the question I would ask, to solve the problems uh, that have been identified here, do we need more levels of government or fewer levels? I, I, I um, bureaucracy is a nightmare. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's just, it's, it's a four letter word no matter how you look at it. Um, one of the challenges we face in Nova Scotia now is they've gotten rid of a level of government, which was the school board, the elected school boards, which you'd think that makes things run smoother. Well, it does, if you're a bureaucrat, because you never have to defend a decision you make, because nobody knows your name, and you know things get done quicker, but when parents have a concern, they call the school board and then they get shuffled off to some bureaucrat who, and in their defense, are lovely people and, and professional, but who have a party line to deliver to you. Um, I, think, I think going back to that flip the system would probably be the best way to, to, to solve the problem, is, is to have have governments step back from that insistence on we're going to manage, we're going to control you know, the business model, right? You know, you, you are a factory, we are, we are in charge. Step back from that and, and trust the teachers to understand their kids and get to know their kids because if you want them to understand their kids, you have to be able to let them do that. You have to be able to say to a teacher, teacher needs to be able to turn to his principal and say, hey boss, can I take my kids to 
A play? Sure. Here you go. Where you go. Take your, take your class to a play. Absolutely, where you go. Right? And as opposed to filling out 15 forms and having to fundraise, and don't even get me started on fundraising. Um, so more government, probably less, is what I would argue. Probably less. Put, it in, put the money in the hands of where it's going to make the most difference, and that's in the hands of the, of the, the people on the ground. Mike Ramsey. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, as I listen to all the speakers, and there's going to be a question in there, but um, from around the world, basically, um, and their reaction to, or their government's reaction to um, the, the pandemic, and as I compare it to what took place here in Ontario, uh, especially, being a board member of um, Waterloo Region uh, Public School Board, it left me thinking, because I think it's such a positive response when I hear from Jamaica going yard to yard, door to door, in Argentina, as Mr. Student uh, mentioned, and it left me thinking about the line that they say is attributed to um, Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And I think it's just kind of, in my mind, it sums up a little bit as to what um, took place in Ontario. So to that point, I'm just wondering, anybody on the panel could say, how do we get out of this? And I heard some of it from, uh, from Grant, but how do we pull out of this when it seems like people are so um, entrenched in their, um, in their uh, positions? I heard one person uh, we were talking casually was saying about the pandemic opened the door for bullies to bully other people, and especially kids and uh, parents. So um, just some reaction uh, to that. T tough question to answer. Uh, things have become incredibly polarized, and that's why, in my mind, I was sort of hoping, or at least when we talk about our children and, and youth, that you know, if we can somehow come together, and I don't know how to do that necessarily, to say, look, we, we can agree to disagree on how the pandemic was managed, but it is over to all intents and purposes. It's now an endemic virus, as all other viruses are. Can we start to heal and, and, and move forward? We, we can talk about our disagreements on how it was managed in a separate forum, but we're all together now facing how we recover. And, and maybe if we can focus in on the future uh, on, and most, there are very few people I think who, I hope, would disagree that we should be you know, doing our best for our youth. And so without really necessarily, I, I would love to have a retrospective on what happened, but, but I think that's a separate conversation uh, in, in some ways as to how do we move forward for our children and youth. And I think that's something that maybe people can rally behind, regardless of what your thoughts were on, on how it was handled. Can we all agree that this road now that we need to focus on is doing the best for our children moving forward now that the pandemic's over? But you're right. I mean, I have I struggle with the polarization with the your pro or your anti. I mean, wait a minute. Why can't I be in between? Um, and that's something I struggled with from the very beginning. Is what what happened to that balanced middle ground? Why we couldn't sort of ha agree to disagree on certain things but still get along? And how we we go back to being allowed to agree to disagree and still like each other and still work together is I, I don't have an answer to that. But that's really where we need to get back to. And that's why if we can focus on moving forward, we can all agree that this happened. This is where we are. What can we do going forward for, for our youth? But it, it, it does require people to be willing to, to take that step to move forward and work with people that you don't always agree on everything with, which is how we used to be able to function. Yep, and then we have a question in the back. What we need to do is we need to get rid of the party hatreds. And we need to get politics out of education. But when I say get politics out of education, I don't mean eliminate the talk of politics in education. I mean that you, sir, and myself can be on completely opposite ends of the political spectrum. At the end of the day, the safest place for a student is in the classroom because it doesn't matter what the teacher's political philosophies are as long as they conduct themselves professionally and allow two students to have a democratic debate or discussion about an issue and ensure that those students aren't gonna get into a violent fist fight, which right now is really where we're going. Um, 
I'm not afraid to say that I think that the uh, four years or five years, I forget their system, uh, prior to the last two years uh, where there was somebody else in the Oval Office uh, was exceptionally detrimental to, uh, uh, to education. And the reason I say that is because I was not allowed to say his name. I was banned from saying the word Trump. No, I'm, I'm serious. We were, we were given a directive. The entire division I was a part of was given a directive, do not have a conversation that mentions the word Trump. It wasn't, it wasn't given to us in paper form. It was sent down to us through the, uh, through the um, uh, principles because you couldn't say something, you couldn't write something like that because everybody knows how that would end up. But what's sad is that we live in a democracy and so, yes, there were a lot of things that we failed on. There, there was a joke during COVID that was uh, basically we all planned for the next day as a group, and we all say, well, you know, are we actually going to be able to do this tomorrow? I don't know. It depends on what the code is tomorrow. Because everything could change. We could shut down in 24 hours, and we, and we wouldn't even know. But, you know, we talk about the lack of stability and the, and the lack of a clear strategy, and that comes into the reflection piece. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is getting the politics out of the political discussion and allowing us to realize that we live in a democracy and then everybody's entitled to their own opinion. As long as we can discuss facts and not feelings, and it's properly mediated by a teacher so that the students understand how to do that, and then you'll change the system. Forrest, question in the back there. Thank you. Uh, so I'm coming from a unique position. Um, I was part of the public school system as a parent, and then I came out, I homeschooled my children, and this is before the pandemic, and my older two went to boarding school, um, because before the pandemic, the educational system I found here in Ontario did not mirror what my experience was. So I was speaking to um, my colleague there from Jamaica, I'm from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, so when I came here at 12 years old, there was a different level of accountability from teachers, how they see teaching. One of the beautiful assets that the Caribbean had, and I heard from St. Vincent Barbados, when the pandemic came, children and education was always at the forefront. It was not the teachers, it was not the adults because prior to pandemic, it was always children and education. When I came here when I was 12 years old, I didn't even see that. I saw it was the teachers and the unions and then the children. So as a youth growing up in the system, I already vowed the type of parent I was gonna be. I battled with teachers prior to pandemic in teaching my children to their capability. So after that battle got tiresome, I pulled them out. Because I witnessed firsthand, it was not about the children. When teachers came up against a parent like me, I was challenging. I gave them too much suggestion. They diagnosed my children as ODD and all of ADD. Why? Because my children had a different way of seeing things and a different way of processing. Took my turn to all of the specialties and the specialties did a report saying there's nothing wrong with this child, you just need to give them more work. So I would print out documents and give it to teachers and say, after my child finish everything, here, give it to them. My eldest, she was then tested as gifted because I knew something was different. I say all this to say prior to pandemic, the culture of education in Ontario was teachers first. Unions, teachers first. What was in the best interest of the adults was not about the child. So when, pan, so when COVID came, I was the one that said this gave permission for bullying. This gave permission for all of those that wanted to exert power before to now come down. When the schools were shut, this is my last son, I have four. The older two there, one is in Ottawa, another one's in Cornell, and I brag about them because that was my hard work. 
That was my hard work because if it was up to the school system, they would have been diagnosed as delinquent. I have advocated for children when Colleen Russell, now the director, she was a superintendent at that time. MP Chan was a trustee at that time. They would come to me. I would be advocating many times, not for just my children, but whatever school my child was in. When I stepped in that door, they were like, oh, uh oh. Because I made it not just for my child, but for every child. I've had an entire school go back to get retrained because I saw the quality that was happening. This was before pandemic. So we had an issue with seeing education an issue prior to pandemic. So when the pandemic came, it just licensed a lot of these adults to continue to put themselves first. So what I saw, and that's when I stepped into politics in 2020, I was a private citizen and I stepped into politics in 2020, because I saw that politics enjoyed the fact that private individuals like myself was not in it. Because we were just more, we were, more, we were concerned about just preservation of our home as we're battling school boards. So when the pandemic happened, I saw the adults put themselves first. They were afraid for themselves. It doesn't matter what the facts or the science said. Because they were afraid, it was true to them. So they did not want the schools open because they were afraid. Science told them the children were not an issue and they were like, I don't care what science says. My feelings trumped fact. And I just said Trump. My feelings trumped facts. And then teachers made it political. I went on the tennis court because I decided my own structure, because I was homeschooling. Like, like when you said you didn't miss a beat, it didn't miss a beat for me and my children. They were like, oh boy, homeschool. All right, here we go. When it shut down, they're like, okay, right? Because I already had a curriculum ready. So for gym, we did tennis. And I saw teachers playing tennis, and I heard them talking about not wanting to go back to the school. They were driving into our tennis courts from out of town, and they were playing tennis, not afraid of the COVID, and bragging about the fact that they do not want to go back to school. And I would interject, and they, you know, then they realized that I was a parent who had a child that they're supporting a lockdown for, and now the child is here playing tennis because you chose to prefer to not go to school and you want to play tennis and you guys are all here and they're having their coffee time and I'm like, oh, what are you going to do? And I'm just watching these teachers playing tennis on our city Toronto courts, drive away and bragging that, yeah, and I got an email, no, we're, and we all are going to stand up. And so the issue was about the adults in the school system who were already putting themselves first. So COVID gave them a license to continue to put themselves first. So how do we get the third bucket and how do we bring back the children? The trust. The parents do not trust the school boards because when it was time for the school boards to really put the children's best interest, parents saw that they put themselves first. So you have to convince the parents and it comes back to accountability. Parents are hurt. I saw that video with the parent who lost her child. That's one of many whose children committed suicide. The facts told them that depression was going up, anxiety was going up, suicide was going up, marijuana stores were opened up, but the schools were shut. Liquor stores were opened up, but the schools were shut. They heard domestic violence. They saw the data. Domestic violence was going up. And the teachers preferred to stay home. They did not care because in their world, they were fine. They didn't care about what was happening in the child's life who was escaping domestic violence, who was getting their breakfast, their lunch, meals, their food, whatever that was being provided at school. They didn't care about that. 
because they and their house were fine. So here in Ontario, for you to, for the Project Youth Energy to get traction, there has to become a conversation of accountability and feel it on a level. I went to Alberta and I'm uh, to, uh, during, I was it April, when the mayoral election was, election was, was, uh, was, was launched and I was already in Alberta and I was doing a training course called Heal Your Life. And intentionally doing that so I can bring it to Toronto to bring it into the school system because healing is necessary. The children are hurt. They're devastated. We told them school's important. Stay away from drugs. And what did they saw? School shut and the marijuana store was open. Many children sacrificed from age 10 all the way up to get scholarships. That year was my, sec my second son ability to go to football. His entire, he, he sacrificed so much to get to where he, I sacrificed as well to doing all the cross-border driving and all of that and investing, investing in whatever my children want to do. And that year, him and his entire graduating class who had scholarships to football across the state, here, shut down. Oh, it's only gonna be two weeks to flatten the curve. So the spirits are still high. A month passed by, two months. Then they heard indefinite. They're done. Try to tell them, okay, let's find something else. No, they saw the adults lie. My son is like, mom, they lied. Stay away from drugs. Don't go into gangs. Don't stay up late. Make great decisions. They sacrificed, they were called names growing up because they stayed on the straight and narrow. And they just saw that the straight and narrow meant nothing to the adults. There is a demographic of young people that are hurt and pissed. They saw social media, influencers, everybody's getting money. And the young people that kept their nose clean, the young people that made all the decisions, the right decisions, what did they get? This is a book called The Children Speak, Unmasking the Harmful Effects of the Lockdown. Many children across Canada had the ability to submit their stories. My son was one of them that submitted it. And it was through Dr. Ahmad Gurgis and some other Canadian doctors who were silenced, who were showing the facts. And they came up with a project just to have the children just expend their energy, right? You talk about expending, just expend their energy, finding a way to get it out. And you should hear the stories that they put in here. They are hurt. Accountability and healing. So yes, it happened. Yes, we accept it. We move forward by first healing. They need healing. The parents need healing and the children need healing. You can knock on all the goals, go yard to yard in Toronto and nobody's listening to you because people's lives were demolished because people put feelings ahead of facts. And that's just what I want to add. The first thing I want to say is thank you because you're the type of parent that every single teacher in the world wants. Um, He's afraid of, but wants. Yes, <laughs> terrified. Um, but uh, d d d just a couple of things. Uh, is that, and it really became more apparent to me when I remembered what, what Toronto was like because I used to live here. And coming in yesterday, um, uh, along the train, I was like, holy crap, there's not a tree in sight. I'm from Manitoba. So there are trees everywhere. We literally have a tree outside of every, sing every single house. There's nowhere here to get away from the concrete. And so I can't even imagine what it would be like to have students inside of a mega metropolis or just a metropolis in general, quite frankly. Um, so that's certainly one of, the, one of the issues that we have and I think that we need to do a better job in the future because obviously this is going to happen again, hopefully not for another 100, 200 years. Um, but to get the students outside because it's so good for their mental health. So you did a fantastic job, especially in terms of getting them, uh, getting them over to play tennis. And I'm sorry about those teachers. Um, but also on Indigenous communities, one of the hardest things that I've experienced is the fact that there's almost no connection in my community um, to culture. 
but I know that's for a lot of other uh, communities as well. The culture was annihilated because of residential schools, and the unfortunate thing now, especially when we went into COVID, is that, that those cultural teachings and finding wild onions and finding wild carrots and uh, going foraging, even though you can easily go down to the store, that was robbed from them because of colonialization. And that is not only a lesson for indigenous people that they can get back through their culture, but also one that just Canada can learn from as well. Just those little things to be able to get back to nature. And that's something that the indigenous people can really help Canada with is to help us ground ourselves. Um, and the last thing um, is just the fact that teachers and parents are ultimate role models to, um, to their children. And I just want to read this as, as from a study, and then I swear to God, I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, but it's, uh, from, uh, it, it's from a study from 1963, and um, essentially what it says is that uh, ch children imitate the behaviors they experience uh, with long-lasting or, or life consequences. Uh, this study essentially tested the hypothesis that the observation of aggression in others uh, would increase the likelihood of aggression in the observer. So most of the teachers in this room know this study. It was done with dolls. Basically, uh, students were made to see violence against the doll, and then they're also shown uh, a peaceful, a peaceful action towards a doll. And uh, the sub subsequent experiments after this uh, had had occurred um, showed that. Uh, uh, showed that children uh, who were exposed to such violence on videotapes uh, yielded similar results with nearly 90% of the children in the aggressive behavior groups later modeling uh, the adults' behaviors uh, by attacking the doll in the same fashion. And 40% of those children exhibited the, the same behavior after eight months. So ultimately, to your point, seeing a teacher, somebody you're supposed to be looking up to, doing that is completely unacceptable. But it also goes back to the need for the teachers to really start emulating, as well as parents to start emulating like you did, what it means to have that determination to push through. On that uh, terrific note, one that's energetic and we're gonna build on in the closing section, I wanna thank Steve, Martha, and, and Grant sincerely, and thanks for the great questions. Thank <laughs> you.